This series of lunchtime conversations intends to capture insights from some of society's thought leaders, given the unprecedented times we're living in. It's the 26th of May, and there's an easing of measures in England. The UK is now adopting a country specific approach to the pandemic. Part of my role at Warwick University is to make sure our education programmes remain relevant and continue to serve the needs of society. To do this, it's important to be part of the research and industry community. The people I'm speaking to in this series form my professional network and I rely on them to inform and help steer our educational programmes. We've seen seismic shifts in all areas of life. The extraordinarily pervasive nature of COVID-19 will have lasting effects. To discuss this, my lunchtime, guest, my lunchtime guest today is Stuart Croft, Warwick's Vice Chancellor and President. Welcome to lunch. Thanks very much. I'm quite hungry, actually. <laughs> Um, you joined Warwick as Professor of International Security. Was that 2007? It was, yes. I'd had a quite a long time at the University of Birmingham before and I had the opportunity to sort of intellectually remake myself by coming mm. to Warwick and it was, a, it was a great choice. So, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm in this situation, there must be many overlaps from leading the response to a security crisis and leading the response to a pandemic. How did the background expertise inform and support how you have led Warwick's response to the pandemic? So I spent um, quite a bit of my career working on, on crises, international security crises and how people think about crises and how sometimes uh, a situation is made into a crisis for, for particular reasons. So coming into this, I mean, clearly it's a, it's a national international crisis that we're in at the moment. I spent quite a lot of time thinking about well, what would that mean for us? And actually, a lot of crisis language is really unhelpful. It's very short term. It's very kind of knee jerk. It's that sort of whole sense that you don't need to follow normal processes. Just do what's right. Mm. Just follow your instinct. Those sorts of things. And, and actually, when you look at the history of crises, those that have tried to think more long term, those who try to think from the basis of principles have, I think, been more successful than those who've just gone into kind of knee jerk or or tried to that dreadful phrase, you know, um, make the best of a crisis. Mm. Yes, I get I've had conversations with other colleagues on in, in other areas looking at the, the concept of resilience and the idea that, the, you know, you, you, you develop an ability to cope with a, a, a stress that's an ongoing stress that needs to have your um, your culture able to handle the ongoing stresses so that when the acute stress comes onto the the acute crisis stress comes onto the system there's enough background strength to respond to that um, and I, I guess maybe you are are you reaching to those core values of the culture to bring to bring through a crisis I think that's I think that's that's right I mean I think um, in a university where you've got lots of different disciplines you've got lots of different cultures and sometimes mm. they connect and yes. sometimes they bang against each other one one against another um, but there are some common kind of values that really come strongly to the fore and the thing that really I was not surprised about but but I was surprised at the same time was as soon as we went into this and we said to everybody it's not only okay to volunteer it's good to volunteer there was this enormous enormous not only explosion of activity of course, at a time when government is saying stay at home, don't do anything, people going out and doing food bank work and looked after kids, amazing stuff in, in, in care homes, the NHS and all the rest of it, amazing stuff. Not only doing it, but really proud to talk about it. Yes. And that was fantastic. That was the real core, I think, of of not just uh, Warwick's university, but, but a lot of higher education. And actually, a lot of our societies, that's actually very representative of who we are, I think, as a society now, rather than some of the images of what we are supposed to be as a society. Yes. Yeah. I mean, from speaking with with my colleagues, your weekly communications where you where you first did put out that is your your fourth your fourth point, your fourth um, thing to remember as we go through and um, the volunteering and, and important to find that. But these communications, they've really enforced a sense of community at Warwick and, and the reassurance that 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 people I know who have listened to them, the reassurance they've got from them is, is very clear. Did you know, did you know to do that? Did you know that that was going to be so powerful at pulling the community together? Um, or 
And did you know it because you knew it instinctively or did you have a kind of predetermined and plan that should you find yourself in some form of crisis, first thing to go to is to make sure there's clear communications? So there was no clear pre-designed plan. I'm, afraid. <laughs> I'm sorry to say I'd love to be able to claim this is all kind of put together. And, and, and part of the reason for doing it actually was um, was also to say that although the country and the world is in crisis, we, we aren't. Yeah, university, we aren't, you know, we, we aren't in some of those really bad places. Many other institutions were, you know, we've we've touch wood come through this without clusters of of, of COVID-19 outbreak, outbreak on, on campus. We've come through this with all the volunteering effectively going out. Um, we haven't had that kind of sense of uh, uh, things are going to fall over immediately because so many people just did their job and carried on doing things. And I, I don't think that the um, the weekly messages actually are about pulling the community together. It's about reflecting a community that already is together. And mm. it's about people understanding and hearing in a space, in a place, when you can't hear it over a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, um, unless you make that Teams or Zoom's um, appointment to do that with somebody. So just trying to have a focal point really, rather than a, a programme of, of kind of building a community or something of, of that sort. And, and why, you ask the question, why, how? Well, at the beginning of the hour lockdown, mm. because we said we would be locking down on the Thursday before the Prime Minister spoke the following Monday. Yes. The weekend before that had, of course, been the weekend when it was clear we had to do this. Um, but how do you get that kind of message out? How do you talk with people and tell people what it is? You, you, you can't write long emails. I mean, how many emails do you get a day? Plenty. <laughs> Plenty. <laughs> it's not going to stand out, is it? But if there's somebody who's talking to you, like we're doing now, you're much more likely just to just to look and listen. Mm. So it just seemed the obvious thing to do, and people around said, just just do it, just just do it. Mm. And from there, people responded. They yeah. said, you want a bit more? Okay, mm. let's do a bit more. Yeah. Now, several weeks later, and, and it's still going. It's a great thing. It's a great thing because people are contributing. Yes. Well, the idea is we're going to try, and, and you know, lots of people have said this, try and build some kind of online time capsule which captures what people have done, how they felt, mm. how they've coped with really difficult situations. I mean, you know, homeschooling, really difficult stuff to be able to do. Um, yes. with shielding a member of your family, really difficult, high pressure things to do. How are people doing that? Tell us, let's all learn from this and let's create that that, that space really for us, uh, digital space for us all to think about this in the future. Mm. Yes. The, um, so, and one of the things you mentioned there that um, the, the well, the news this weekend has all been about the critical role that advisors have um, and the the background advisors have certainly come to the fore in the news this weekend. Do you have advisors that you turn to or do you have teams or do you have formal? How do you how do you make who do you look for to take advice from? So I think it's only really in the world of politics that you have these special advisors and these kind of strange sorts of things. Um, I think you know for for the rest of us in 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 the real economy, dare one say it, um, we, we all have our teams. We all have our management teams. We all have people we work with. Um, I have a couple of people that have been mentors, and I will pick up a phone to them. I now actually do this, which is something we never did before. It was always yes. on the top. Um, just say, am I, am, I, am, I, am I losing it here? Am I thinking about this correctly? Every human being needs sounding boards. Every human being, every human being needs to have people to work with. And every human being needs to have somebody who says, no, do not do that. Do not say that. Do not ever, <laughs> ever again, even though you've been going on about it for the last week. Yeah. Uh, um, and we've got um, one of our students, Louis Latouf, he's, he's asking, um, he is asking specifically around the decision making for, I think, for planning forward. Um, and there's, there's been a real interest, certainly in the past couple of years, around the role of big data and artificial intelligence and looking for trends and allowing AI to help with the decision making process. Does that come into the world at all in reality when you're in this crisis situation? Or is that for when there is predictable trends that you can foresee? Can you rely on it? That data is really important. Mm. Uh, I mean, um, data is really important. Not all data is big data, of course, but data is really important. And being able to understand um, 
just things like traffic flows, for example, um, which you know you can you can stand and watch, but actually it's much better to have a count of people or cars or buses or whatever it might be to be able to work out when we're thinking into the future. Um, how might campus be safe to come back to for a larger number of people in that next phase over the course of the summer? Where are the pressure points in terms of human beings moving across on the campus? Data tells you that. You need mm. data to understand what that, uh, how that can therefore be changed or, or, or adapted. So, so I think having some control of, of really useful information and data is critically important. And I apologise, that's my phone going off. You want to get it? <laughs> I don't think I dare. <laughs> so my other half, she's working in the other room. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I guess that's a that's this is the times we live in, Stuart. <laughs> and so. she's picked it up, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, moving forward, the um, during during the period of this, you know, when when we we had the pandemic, you know, or at least we are in the pandemic, but when we had the really the acute stress on the system. It seemed to me that we just kind of braced ourselves, you know, stay at home was the message and we just braced ourselves. Um, but now we're we're beginning to reflect and evaluate and take steps towards the new way. So um, I have a question from Shirley, Shirley Sturzacker. Um, how regularly are Warwick in dialogue with other universities in the UK? And is it in the UK? Is it global? Um, and how much does it help inform each other? How, how do we work together as part of the higher education community? So there's um, there's a lot of communication uh, going on at the moment. Um, so for example, the, the Russell Group Board meets every week. Uh, normally it meets once a quarter. So this is a really big intensification of, 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 of engagement. Um, Universities UK, uh, the chief executive uh, puts on a meeting uh, three or four times a week. So I'll go on a call every week and there'll be 16 or 17 other vice chancellors. They might vary week to week who is on the call, but there's another space for, for, for sharing there. We have a West Midlands group um, and there's a lot of communication there and a lot of bilateral communication going on there as well. I would say there is probably 10 times more communication going on yeah. between between universities at senior levels at the moment in the UK than there would be, as it were, in previous times. Internationally is really important as well because um, we have a really close relationship with Monash. And of course, yeah. the Australians went through some of this crisis earlier than the UK or their response was different, shall we say, in the early stages yeah. than that of the UK. So there was a tremendous amount of learning that we could take from our friends in, in Monash. Um, and in China as well, I mean, we've got some really close relationships with uh, with some of the universities there and you know they were saying to us what do you need and I would say to them we need face masks yeah I don't need a face mask but you know what the NHS needs face masks and mm. those care homes they need face masks and Chinese universities sending us thousands of face masks to distribute I mean it's a fantastic thing a fantastic support network whatever the international politics of all that just the, yes. the human to human connection was 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 fantastic um, and I think we're all we're all in this process of trying to work through bits of detail because it's it, the, the thing that is most unusual is that we are, of course, so tightly constrained by what it is that government and in our case, Public Health England say is right and wrong behaviour. Yes. Most of us in this country are really <laughs> closely constrained by what is, <laughs> says and what is being done. And, and of course, not being in government you're not always sure what the next move will be. But I have to say um, that the way that government has reached out has been absolutely incredible recently. So in the last um, last three weeks, um, I've been on a call to the um, Secretary of State for Education, the Cabinet Secretary, uh, four times with the University Secretary, two times with the, the Research uh, uh, Minister. I mean, extraordinary reaching out. And yes. one of the really amazing things is this technology has allowed people to kind of reach out and and engage and speak and that's a big positive i hope that we take forward into the future yes yeah i mean even even for me to have the opportunity to have a conversation with you in other circumstances would be very very difficult but it was so easy to get in touch with you let you know what i was doing and you were so fast to respond and just say yeah sounds good idea let's do it and I'm not sure that flexibility and that um, ad adaptiveness, that agile way of communicating and creating networks 
is as well enabled without this kind of technology. So, I think that's I think that's partly true. Mm. Um, because the other part is um, how we think about using our interactions. So if you had said to me, could you before all this came up, could you could you come and do a, a lunchtime session um, on a on a Tuesday in a few weeks time? I'd have said yes. Yeah. But you wouldn't have thought to do it. Mm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, and you know, I, I do a, a number of things in, in WBS um, mm. over the course of the year uh, and always really enjoy it. And it's so the scheduling is is always a challenge, but with enough notice we can do it. But we th we sort of think more readily, actually. Surely somebody's got half an hour sitting at home yes, <laughs> to yes. get a team <laughs> or whatever it might be. In the way we think, oh, surely somebody hasn't got half an hour to, to come and sit in a classroom or a lecture theatre or, or an office. Mm. Mm. And so going forward, going forward, the uh, for me, I think we're, we're moving into a period that I think is for me, it, it feels more unsettling, although um, the, the crisis is easing. It feels to me like the the way we're going forward is less it's less certain where we're going to and um, how we're going to get there. I think seems that seems to me that there could be some potholes and some cliff edges that um, are not obvious because we've not navigated that before. Um, what what do you feel we should be careful about um, and where do you feel the kind of opportunities lie for for universities for um, for higher education organisations? So the, the, the potholes are many. Yes. <laughs> Inevitably, there are many. Um, not only on the health side, so you know the big pothole of a of a second spike sometime this autumn is clearly something that everybody worries about. But the whole economy has had. I think it was the Economist who said the economy's had a heart attack, um, and and you know everybody is worrying about their job, or their partner's job, or their children's job, or their parents' job, or their yes. sister, or whatever it might. Everybody's worried about somebody somewhere and what might happen. And um, how the economy gets going again is is a really big challenge. I don't think any of us really, really know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. One of the big challenges I think that we've created for ourselves in this country is, is we have our two meter social distancing rule. Yes. Almost, in fact, apart from Spain, the only country in Europe that does, and World Health Organization, of course, says one meter. If, if you think about it logically, of course, um, two meters means that you need to have a quarter of the number of people in a space than you'd have with one meter. Now, I'm not saying one meter on its own is, is good enough. You need to have all sorts of other measures and so on as well. But how do we have a conversation about what, why are we doing something radically different from Italy or France or yes. Germany in terms of social distancing? If at the same time we want to give people the reassurance and the opportunity to open up the economy to save those jobs and, and help things get back towards normal. Now, maybe we could do one meter and we all wear face masks. Mm. Lots of challenges around uh, around that, as uh, as we know, but it would be fantastic if we could start to have those sorts of debates. I, think. Yeah. I spoke I spoke with uh, Amanda Lam yesterday um, and she's based in Hong Kong and she works at Disneyland Hong Kong. And um, I was asking her because you know, Hong Kong hasn't had a lockdown um, and yet you know, they have managed to chase off the pandemic for now. And so I was asking you, you know, how, how, you know how, how did they manage that? How could they do it so well and the UK do it so badly? You know, what, what was the differences? And, and one of the things, well, it's just two things. They have history, you know, they have SARS Absolutely. and they have history. So they recognised that was one of the things she said. And the other thing that I thought was, um, it, it was interesting to hear, uh, certainly for me an insight that she didn't focus on this test track trace that wasn't it was all about behaviors so from having experienced SARS she as a as a as a culture as a as a city people are much because they're so tightly they live together so closely as it is it's so dense they're much more um likely to wear face masks if they have any sign of a cold or a flu it's practice they're much better at washing their hands you know they um they they're very they're they're um oh, the words but they they you know going to the bathroom they always put the lid down when they flush the toilet and these things that things that they've been learnt as a culture that they just adopt these behaviors and um, just anyway in in daily life and i thought that was interesting that, that you know maybe we've had quite a bit of press about 
maybe these solutions that are going to come our way, but it seems to have been cultural behaviour that has really chased it off from Hong Kong rather than having the answer developed and then put in place. I thought that was interesting. Yes, I mean, it's, it's um, uh, I suppose, quite um, predictable for, for, for us in our culture to think, oh, there needs to be a, a magic bullet that's going to solve this. The vaccine will solve this. The magic yeah. bullet will solve this. Um, but it might not. And that doesn't mean everything has to stop. It just means we have to exactly to say change how we change how we behave. And, you know, um, uh, the the uh, the last week of our term um, and I went and did a session in, in, in WBS. And uh, the first thing to, to note was that um, it wasn't very well attended because students had already started, as indeed had some colleagues to say, I don't feel safe out well yes. with the government message. Um, and of course, a lot of the big companies had moved down that road much faster than any other parts of the uh, the economy. But but second, of course, any any student who with um, uh, East or Southeast Asian heritage, they all had their face masks. Of course yeah. they did. It's just perfect, normal, natural thing to do. And, uh, and and we don't. And I suspect we're going to have to learn to change our behaviours around some of these yes. practices. Mm. Yeah, and um, may I ask? I just uh, I would just like to ask about. Um, you sit on you sit on various boards outside of the university, which um, I, I, which clearly in your position, it's essential to have that network. And and in in Warwick, we have a you know a pillar around inclusion. And I guess I, I've, I'm I'm mindful that you chair the board of Equality Challenge Unit. And um, and I, I just going forward. Uh, in the world that we live in, you know, that the opportunities and whilst I'll speak to Mel Harrison next week, who, who talks about disability and she's an advocate for that. Um, but, you know, talking to her up, running up to this, the um, some people with uh, with disabilities, for instance, may find in the long run there might be opportunities for them where in the past, if we do accept working from home more readily, then if you require someone to help you with personal care, then this will open up a job a job market for you and um, it's hard though it's hard to address I, I mean I think it's great that we have it as a strategy and I, I recognize Warwick does a lot to improve in this area and to be as good as we can be how do you think that looks in the future and, and what do you think like someone like me how can I change my practice uh, as a as somebody who lectures and, and works with students and, and involves and, and, and collects the research resources to convey and to discuss with my students. How can I do it better? How can I be better at inclusion in my work? So unfortunately, I don't chair Equality Challenges Unit anymore because it's been merged into a bigger body, Advance HE. So I don't play that role anymore, but I did for a period of time. And um, really, as you've just been saying, it's uh, um, the, the drive to have more reality to inclusion is certainly something I feel deeply, deeply passionate about. Um, so we need to think about our recovery phase, whatever it's going to be called, the, the reset, whatever this thing is going to be in front of us in the future, um, in an integrated, in an integrated way where we think about what are the implications of what we do for all people in our communities. So, for example, if we are going to have to think about campus and how we uh, minimise those areas where people might congregate, um, we need to make sure that we think about those, for example, in terms of access for wheelchair users. Mm going to think about uh, masks, for example. I mean, I think we know that one of the great challenge for uh, for people who are hard of hearing or deaf, if you've got a mask there, you have yeah. no idea what people are saying. So there are masks where you can see people's faces. Those sorts of practical things that I think we can all be advocates for, we can all ask for. Your Hong Kong example is, is very interesting. As far as I'm aware, nobody in Hong Kong has a mask that you can see through. Mm, no. They have not in that culture, as advanced as they are in terms of the health for all the reasons you were just saying, they have not then taken that step to say, well, how do we make this a more inclusive collective experience? And I think for us, thinking about the detail actually yes. is really important, what really impacts upon people's lives. Mm. Yes, yeah, I think that's that's certainly coming through from me as being insightful that, um, you know, the, these visions of where we need to go, we need to have them, but we also need to 
chase it through to the detail to actually make it a reality. And that's coming through, I think, as being it's a significant element of, of how do we recover um, from and, and, and determine our new future. I guess, how do we do that? And um, I'm going to let you go. I let you go and, and actually have lunch. But I, what do you do to unwind? What does Stuart Croft do to unwind? Um, so um, I we have a couple of dogs. I love walking the dogs. Um, I really love walking the dogs. And um, what kind of dogs have you got? Uh, two Labradors. Oh, lovely! Lovely. And they are soft as anything, um, <laughs> as Labradors are. And um, they they've helped me get into um, steps. So I count my steps at the moment. I'm on the the uh, the, the Warwick Walk in the World um, app, and I've become I'm a slightly competitive person, I have to say. So you know, uh, originally I was going to make sure I hit those ten thousand a day. Now over the weekend I've hit twenty thousand a day, and I feel really pleased with myself. But it makes me feel uh, healthier, definitely. And football, I love football. I'm, uh, I'm a season ticket holder at Aston Villa. Aston Villa. And I, Yes. Yeah, yeah, good enough. <laughs> but, but whether 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 I'll get to go for the rest of this year, I just don't know. Yeah. There's things we just don't know. No. Well, thank you very much for sharing these insights. For me, they are enormously useful and they help help me steer our education programmes and the, any work that I do to develop our educational offerings. For our current students, these insights are so lovely then they can use them to help shape their research. Um, and for the wider Warwick community, uh, thank you very much for sharing. If anyone listening to this would like to hear from Stuart, um, well, you could drop me a line, but you're probably going to find him on Warwick's website yourself. Um, and if you're watching this on YouTube, you know, follow the link on the closing slide. The series will also be made available as a podcast. Just search Insights Over Lunch on your preferred listening platform. Thank you. Enjoy lunch.